In the early 1930s, a small pacifist Christian sect, known as the Sheep of the Lord, settled in the United States near Moab, Utah. The sect consisted of 14 adults, seven couples betrothed to each other before God, and 16 children. All of the couples, with the exception of the childless Peter and Abigail Godot, had at least two children, the eldest of whom was 13. In addition to the Godots, the men were Aaron, Barak, Elijah, Gideon, Jacob, and Solomon, and the women were Claudia, Esther, Eve, Hosanna, Ruth, and Sarah. Among the sheep of the Lord were both male and female artisans who made products that were shipped to much of the United States, taking advantage of Moab's convenient location for trade, while others worked in the city in various positions. For example, Gideon was a skilled carpenter who specialized in making high-quality furniture, while Abigail worked as a maid in the main hotel in Moab. The sect had a few vehicles and a few draft horses, and they raised chickens for egg and meat production, as well as some vegetables, although they were not self-sufficient. The sect was able to live relatively peacefully as long as Pat Mundy was sheriff, as he and his deputies maintained law and order and administered justice uniformly. However, he retired in 1934 and moved out of state. Jack Quinn, the new sheriff, turned out to be a different kind of man. Quinn was corrupt, cowardly, inefficient, ineffective, self-serving, or a combination of all of these, and order and justice suffered. Two families, the elders and the Jenkinses, took advantage of this. The elders consisted of a father, a mother, and three sons. The Jenkinses were a father and four sons. The mother died in the late 1920s. They were all criminals, hoodlums, and malcontents who liked to drink, which became easy after Prohibition was repealed in December 1933. One of their favorite pastimes was to pester the Lord's sheep, which became especially easy since they were pacifists. Elder and Jenkins' sons especially enjoyed molesting women, as they were all young and above average looking. Claudia, Ava, and Ruth had beautiful faces, while Esther, Hosanna, and Sarah, as far as one could tell from the women's clothing of the time, had what would be called seductive bodies in modern times. Abigail was different from the other members of the sect. Although she paid lip service to pacifism, she actually had a tough, business-like nature, and other sect members chastised her several times for her defiant nature. She was large for a woman, especially a woman born in 1937, at 180 centimeters tall and muscular. As a child, she had beaten every boy she knew in the race and was a real tomboy until she was 16. She and Peter had married when she was still a teenager, though that was the age of majority for marriage. She had a pretty, though not classically handsome face, a slender, firm body and breasts much larger than one would expect from a slender woman. Sheriff Quinn never did anything substantial to rein in the Elder and Jenkins clans, and by 1937, their persecution of the Lord's sheep had reached an unacceptable level. An attempted rape of Abigail by the two younger Jenkins brothers while she was working as a hotel maid was foiled only because Abigail smashed a lamp over the head of one of them and kicked the other three times in the balls. When the hotel charged her for the cost of the lamp and Sheriff Quinn pretended not to believe her, she immediately quit and walked six kilometers home with steam coming out of her ears. When she returned home, she demanded a meeting of the adult members of the sect and resolutely demanded any action. When Aaron, the cult leader, adopted his usual turn-the-other-cheek credo, Abigail exploded. She threw on the conference room table an issue of Soldier of Fortune magazine that a guest had left in one of the hotel rooms she was renting. On a page with bent corners was an ad entitled, Problems? Contact T-Rex. We don't have the money to hire someone to help us, Aaron groaned when he saw the ad. Abigail grabbed the publication and read the text of the ad. Sometimes good people can't handle physical intimidation, threats, and manhandling. If you need help, contact T-Rex San Francisco. We will go anywhere west of the Mississippi. Non-monetary compensation can be arranged. Results are guaranteed. 
After much discussion and Abigail's persistence, the men, the only ones allowed to vote, unanimously agreed. The next day, Peter and Abigail sent a telegram to T-Rex, and a few hours later, T-Rex responded by agreeing to arrive in Moab within 48 hours. Thomas James Rexroth, known for most of his life as T-Rex, was three-quarters American, mostly of Dutch descent, and one-quarter Japanese. His maternal grandfather was an intellectual who was introduced to and became fascinated with karate in Japan as a young man. His maternal grandfather and his American grandmother, who once worked as a nurse in Japan, moved to San Francisco before T's mother was born. Rex When T. Rex was a teenager, his grandfather introduced him to karate, which was unheard of in the United States at the time. When T. Rex grew older, he began practicing karate. Rex was strong, athletic, and intelligent, but very shy and lacked confidence in social situations. Karate helped him gain confidence in all aspects of life. Being too young to participate in World War I, T. Rex joined the U.S. Army as a teenager in 1928 and proved himself as a fighter. He was proficient in all weapons of the time, as well as hand-to-hand -hand combat, including karate, which his grandfather taught him. He participated in over a dozen successful covert operations, never mentioned in history books and classified by the military establishment for over 50 years in other countries on behalf of the U.S. government. When T-Rex was discharged from the Army, he worked for a time in his father's business while running survival courses on the side. A failed love affair, boredom from working in his father's business, and a trust fund from grandparents on both sides of the family led him to seek adventure and gave him the means to do so. At 180 centimeters tall and 110 kilograms of strong muscle, he decided to become what could variously be called a mercenary, a soldier of fortune, an adventurer, or as he liked to call himself, a paladin. Not in need of money, he enjoyed bargaining away non-monetary compensation by helping desperate but poor clients. T-Rex traveled in search of adventure in a small truck with a bedroom in the cargo area next to a strapped-down pink motorcycle and sidecar and a variety of weapons. Weapons included a recently introduced, in Japan, but acquired through his grandfather's connections, Arasaka 97 sniper rifle with telescopic sight. T-Rex showed up at the Lord's Sheep Shelter 47 hours after agreeing to help. He was first greeted with great enthusiasm by Abigail and then by the rest of the sect, including the children. T-Rex was very impressed with the appearance of the women, especially Abigail, but certainly not just her. After dinner that night, the men, and at Abigail's insistence, met with T-Rex to discuss the abominations the sect had suffered at the hands of the Elder and Jenkins families. T-Rex was particularly concerned about Abigail's attempted rape and the fact that one of the buildings on their property had been destroyed. It had been set on fire the day before he arrived with the children, who fortunately got out of the building in time when the fire started. T-Rex assured the sect members that he would handle the situation and that they would not be disturbed again for ten days. Peter and Aaron remained skeptical. In the end, the men of the sect asked what kind of compensation T-Rex in case of success. Three nights with one of your beautiful women, or one night with each of them, was his answer. The men were stunned. A sly smile appeared on Abigail's face, which did not go unnoticed by T-Rex. After much protesting, offers of other compensation, and expressions of disbelief that his services could cost so much, T-Rex made an offer. I will give you a free evaluation of my abilities tomorrow. After that, you either accept or I'll leave. The men of the sect apparently agreed. T-Rex slept on the bed in the cargo hold of his truck, and the next morning after breakfast he told the adult men of the sect, and Abigail, who kept demanding to be included, his plan for the day. Peter reluctantly allowed Abigail to accompany T-Rex, especially when he drove his pink Harley with a sidecar off the inside of the truck up the ramp to the ground. You can't go to town in that thing, Peter complained. Everyone will think you're gay. 
The word gay to describe a homosexual male had only first appeared in the American lexicon in 1914, but was apparently already well known to Peter. That's the thing, T smiled. Rex. Bullies grossly underestimate you if they think you're a homosexual or a sissy. Abigail was excited as she put on the spare pair of goggles and padded helmet that T had given her. Rex so she could ride in the stroller, and by 11 a.m. they were in town. Their first stop was at the sheriff's office. Offhandedly, T. Rex demanded an explanation as to why the two younger Jenkins boys had not been arrested for attempted rape. Although T. Rex somewhat intimidated them, Sheriff Quinn stood by his opinion that the evidence was insufficient. After speaking with the sheriff, T. Rex told him, I will file a civil suit against the Jenkinses after I receive compensation from the hotel. Why would you do that? asked Abigail with a smile as they left the sheriff's office and got into a pink Harley with a sidecar. So he could tell the Jenkins boys where we are? T smiled. Rex, have them come to us? T. Rex parked his pink Harley in front of the hotel and leisurely walked inside with Abigail. The receptionist gingerly greeted Abigail before T-Rex slammed his fist on the counter and said, Get the manager in here. After clearly explaining to the manager that cutting Abigail's paycheck for defending herself against an attempted rape was a bad thing, because I'll make sure it makes the front page of the local paper, Abigail received her last paycheck in cash, no deductions, and another $10 for her trouble. T-Rex and Abigail waited by his motorcycle for the Jenkins boys to arrive. Are you sure they're coming? Abigail asked. If you were right to tell me they had a phone, then I'm sure, T replied confidently. Rex. Not two minutes later, Abigail said, Well, your wish has come true. So here they came. Only it wasn't just the younger two, but the older brother as well. Great, T replied. Rex. Just ignore them and let them make the first move. Bart Jenkins walked over to the motorcycle and asked, are you the gay guy looking for my brothers? Are you asking if they like sleeping with boys? I guess they do, T answered carelessly. Rex crossed his arms over his chest. I'm going to teach you some manners, Bart growled, delivering a punch to T. Rex. T. Rex effortlessly blocked the blow and then delivered a karate kick to Bart's solar plexus. Bart bent in half, groaned, and dropped out of the fight. Then T-Rex turned to Sam and Trent Jenkins. I understand that you mistook Mrs. Godot for one of your asshole buddies and tried to rape her. Apologize to her right now. I'll cut you, Sam shouted, accompanying his words with a few mostly unintelligible swear words as he and Trent rushed toward T-Rex, flashing their knives. T-Rex kicked Sam sideways on his right knee, causing it to malfunction, and as he stumbled, T-Rex elbowed him in the face, rendering him unconscious. Trent was overwhelmed with the desire to avenge his brothers and lost his balance trying to hit T-Rex. T-Rex calmly stepped aside and in the same motion grabbed Trent by the wrist of the hand in which he was holding the knife and in another smooth motion stepped over him and broke his arm at the elbow, causing the knife to hit him and Trent to scream. T-Rex pulled an Ensign E-20 camera out of a saddlebag on his Harley and took several pictures of the two Jenkins boys lying down and one sitting and screaming and the two knives. Trent was the only one of the three still conscious, so T-Rex grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and led him toward the sheriff's office. On the way, he told Trent in no uncertain terms that he had to confess to attacking him with a knife and attempting to rape Mrs. Godot, or the next time T-Rex saw him, he would kill him. Trent mumbled his confession and apologized to Abigail. Then T-Rex told the sheriff, after the doctor fixes his arm, arrest him for assault with a deadly weapon and attempted rape, and handed Trent's knife to Sheriff Quinn. The sheriff seemed to hum in agreement. One more thing, Sheriff, T spat out. Rex, tell the Jenkinses and the elders that if anyone harasses the Lord Sheep again, they'll have it a lot worse than Bart, Sam, and Trent had it today. 
Sheriff Quinn stared at him incredulously and only nodded. As they walked out of the sheriff's office, Abigail felt dizzy. Wow, you really are just like the commercials, aren't you? T-Rex only smiled, noticing again what a lovely woman Abigail was. With your last statement to Quinn, you're basically inviting them to attack us? You're as perceptive as you are beautiful, T smiled. Rex, making Abigail blush. On the way back to T's camp, Rex made a few stops to survey the area. About halfway between the town and the village, the paved road turned right, and the dirt road leading to the village turned left. T. Rex spent a lot of time looking around the area, and Abigail watched with interest. When T. Rex smiled broadly, she asked, What are you smiling about? I have a plan, he replied. Back at the campground, Abigail excitedly recounted what T. Rex, accepting congratulations, T. Rex said, There is a downside. I believe both clans, perhaps even with Quinn's unofficial help, are likely to come here at first light tomorrow. You must decide now whether you need my help or not. The cult members asked for some time to decide in private, this time excluding Abigail despite her protests. Aaron turned to the others. I think we can enlist his help and then renegotiate his compensation. We will tell him that no wife will want to sleep with him, and he is not the kind of man who is capable of raping someone. However, we have no choice but to agree, Peter intervened. I don't know how one man can stop them, but from what Abigail told us about how he took out three of them in a matter of seconds, and given the weapons in the back of his truck, I believe he can succeed. The cult members turned to T-Rex and disingenuously told him that they agreed to his compensation. Abigail really wanted to help T-Rex. He really needed someone to run some errands for him. T-Rex drove his truck up to the intersection halfway between the town and the village and parked it, blocking the dirt road. Abigail reached that spot riding one of the horses. There, she and Abigail planted several dynamite charges on either side of the dirt road so that if threatening vehicles passed on either side of the truck, the charges could be set off. Two charges were placed on each side, the first to prevent the cars from going around the truck and the second to detonate them if they persisted. About 250 yards from the intersection, Abigail and T-Rex took advantage of a natural ledge and reinforced it, turning it into a sniper's nest, and placed detonators for dynamite charges behind it. At dusk, Abigail returned to the compound, ate dinner, and drove back to the sniper's nest. She and T-Rex shared a meal, and then Abigail watched T-Rex through binoculars so he could get some sleep. After three hours, she woke him up and returned to camp, hugging him for good luck. T-Rex was very pleased with her goodbye hug. Criminals and bullies are so predictable, T chuckled to himself. Rex, when through his binoculars, saw two pickup trucks approaching the intersection with men with rifles sitting in the backs of them. With his sniper rifle, two pistols and plenty of ammunition in the sniper's nest, and his motorcycle, sans sidecar behind him, he was pretty sure everything would work out just right. Watching through binoculars as the two cars drew closer to the intersection, T-Rex counted ten men. One, obviously Trent Jenkins, had his arm plastered, and another, obviously Sam Jenkins, had his nose covered with a Band-Aid. One of them was Sheriff Quinn himself, only without his uniform. He also recognized Bart Jenkins. He assumed the others were members of the Elder and Jenkins clans. T-Rex didn't wait for the shooting to start. As soon as the vehicles tried to circle the truck on one side, he detonated the first charge from that side and then began firing his sniper rifle. Given his skill level, from about 250 meters he couldn't miss, and he didn't miss once. He killed both drivers first and then began killing the others, making sure Quinn was one of his first kills. Their return fire was largely ineffective as the villains had only ordinary Winchesters, which, while theoretically accurate at 500 meters or more, were only accurate at 250 meters when operated by experienced marksmen, which apparently Jenkins and Elder were not. A few bullets hit the sniper's nest area but did no damage. Within five minutes, 
eight of the ten were wounded, and perhaps seven of the eight were fatally wounded. After a few more minutes, the two remaining bandits, one of whom appeared to be Bart Jenkins, ran in the direction that the abandoned pickup trucks were closing in. T-Rex jumped up on his Harley and rushed after the remaining two villains. Once on the other side of the trucks, he stopped, took aim with his rifle, and killed them both before they could reach the hilly area. Then T-Rex walked around the scene of the beating, saw that Sam Jenkins was still alive, though barely, and shot him in the head. T-Rex loaded all ten bodies into the trunk of his truck, drove to a bluff about five kilometers from town on a paved road, and dumped the bodies into the ravine. He then returned to the site of the massacre, dug up the unexploded charges, and rode his motorcycle to pick up Abigail. He didn't want to involve other cult members besides Abigail in what he was doing, and also told her not to ask any questions. He and Abigail drove the pickup trucks up to the ravine where the bodies were located, pushed one truck off the cliff into the ravine, and then drove back. He then drove his motorcycle to the ravine while Abigail drove the remaining pickup truck there again, and they also pushed it into the ravine. Then T-Rex threw several sticks of dynamite at the trucks, resulting in an explosion so powerful that most of what was in the ravine was destroyed. Once the bodies and trucks were done with, Abigail got into the back seat of the Harley, and they rode back to the truck. By the time it had completely dawned, T-Rex and Abigail returned to the campground with the truck and motorcycle in the cargo area. They greeted the others and then had breakfast with the rest of the sect. After breakfast, the men wanted to talk, and Abigail volunteered to wash the truck's cargo hold, primarily to wash away the blood, though she didn't tell anyone about it. What happened? Aaron asked, when T-Rex was alone with the men in the briefing room. Jenkins, Elder and Quinn were going to kill your entire sect and destroy your entire village, replied T calmly. Rex, how do you know that? Peter asked. Because they all had rifles and evil facial expressions, and considering they burned down one of your buildings just two days ago, I can't draw any other conclusion, replied T carelessly. Rex, where are they now? Solomon asked. You don't need to know, replied Ty. Rex, if anyone ever asks you, I want you to be able to honestly say you don't know. The only thing you need to know is that they will never bother you again. Being naive about many things, the men of the cult understood what he was talking about, and they quite rightly didn't want to know more. After a long pause, Aaron asked, What about Mrs. Elder? I'll give her money to move back in with her two sisters in St. Louis and see to the purchase of the house, replied T-Rex. After about another half hour or so of discussion, T-Rex moved on to what was important to him. Now about my compensation, T smiled. Rex, another meaningful pause then. I'm sorry, Mr. Rex Roth, but we're going to have to come to some other arrangement. We've talked to all the wives and none of them want to sleep with you. We can't force them, and an honorable man like you won't rape them. So we'll have to find some other compensation, Aaron replied nervously, stammering most of the time. Really? T wondered. Rex. So you're going to renege on your word? Uh, there's nothing we can do about it, Mr. Rex Roth. We're willing to give you everything we have, even our meager savings, Aaron pleaded. Well, I hope you won't mind if I get confirmation of your assessment of the wives' interest, will you? With those words, T-Rex walked out of the conference room and headed to his truck, where Abigail had just finished cleaning it. He was followed by all the men. Abigail, T addressed her. Rex, the husbands refuse to pay me the compensation they agreed to. They say that none of the wives want to sleep with me to fulfill the terms of our agreement. Is that true? Abigail looked at the husband sternly. After he saved us, you want to renege on the deal? She barked at them. Then her demeanor changed as she looked T-Rex in the eyes and said, That's not true, T-Rex. If you take me, I'll honor the deal we made with you. T-Rex smiled widely because Abigail was the only one he really wanted. Peter forbade Abigail from honoring the deal.
Aaron told her that it was against God's will, and all the other husbands protested. It didn't make any difference. Abigail went into her room, put her best clothes and a few keepsakes in her bag, and headed for T-Rex. She asked with a smile, Where to? To the hotel where you used to work, he smiled back. Peter literally fell to his knees, begging. Abigail just stroked his head and said, You made a deal. He risked his life for us, and I can't say no to him. A minute later, the truck was already rolling down the dirt road toward Moab. The truck ride was uneventful until they reached the intersection where most of the carnage took place. Then Abigail, with a sly grin, turned to T-Rex and asked, If you could choose any of the women in the camp, who would you pick? T-Rex laughed. You know very well it would be you. Why? Because you're the most fascinating woman I've ever met, besides being beautiful and sexy. That's why. You're making me blush, Abigail grinned. I have a serious question for you, Abigail. What stage of your menstrual cycle are you at? You don't have to worry about that. Peter and I have been trying to get pregnant for three years without success. I think I'm infertile. Why do you ask? Not ready to be a father? I'd be more ready with you than anyone else, but since I have to get you back, it would probably be best not to have a baby, T smiled. Rex. When they reached the hotel, they didn't waste any time. Without the slightest nervousness or shyness, Abigail stripped naked and lured T Rex into the bathtub and shower in their suite. As soon as they stepped in and adjusted the water temperature, T. Rex, stroking Abigail's gorgeous body, remarked, You are the most beautiful woman I have ever seen, but also the most beautiful woman I could ever imagine. Afterward, they exchanged their first passionate kiss. After they showered and wiped themselves down, T. Rex picked Abigail up and carried her to the double bed in the suite. He had a big smile on his face. When they finally got out of bed an hour later, they showered together again. There was no danger in a combined bath and shower, and then dressed for dinner. Abigail styled her hair and put on her only pretty dress. Wow, you look amazing, T remarked sincerely. Rex, even without the makeup that women in San Francisco seem to require, you're sexier than any other woman I've ever seen. Abigail blushed and kissed T Rex. I want you to have the best impression in the world. She smiled and kissed him again. I'd tell her I'm ready, thought T-Rex, smiling to himself. Only I want her to keep trying. Abigail had never had to go to a fancy restaurant before. T-Rex picked the best one in Moab, even though it was far from the best in San Francisco. They had a pleasant time as Abigail was fascinated by T-Rex about the adventures he had had around the world. After dinner, they walked all over the city, three times to digest their food. Abigail was just radiant, and T-Rex felt better than he ever had in his memory. As soon as they were no longer full, Abigail pulled T-Rex to her and kissed him hard. Let me do something nicer tonight, she teased. Only after I give you some more pleasure, he grinned. Rude, she laughed and ran towards the hotel. Waking up the next morning in each other's arms, they made love. It wasn't animal sex like the previous day and night. It was real lovemaking, as emotionally satisfying as it was physically satisfying. For the next two days, T-Rex and Abigail were hardly apart. They rode his motorcycle. She sat on the back seat and snuggled tightly against him, all over the area, had picnics, hiked around the neighborhood, ate the best food Moab had to offer partied like minks, and made love like neither of them had ever made love before. When they woke up after their third night together, their sadness was palpable. I don't want to let you go, T moaned. Rex, and tears came to his eyes, which contradicted his stern exterior. Then take me with you, Abigail replied, tears welling up in her eyes. I know you love me, and I love you. How can I when you are married, he wondered. The frown on Abigail's face was replaced by a slight bright smile. How about I tell you what being married means to the Lord's sheep? Okay, T 
Tyrannosaur muttered. In the sheep of the Lord sect, marriages are performed before God, and other members of the sect perform the ceremony. There are no marriage certificates or any other documents or actions that are recognized by law in Utah or any other state. We are married in the eyes of God, but not the law, she stated, and then smiled. When Abigail saw that T-Rex couldn't find the words, she continued. I was just a teenager and was in a bad place when I married Peter and joined the cult. I needed direction. I have never been a pacifist and don't believe in what Aaron and others preach. If there was a manly, exciting, loving man who wanted to take me away from the cult, I'm sure I would agree. After a meaningful pause and a light kiss on the nose of T-Rex, she asked, Do you know anyone who might be interested in that? A few seconds after it flew off her lips, they were kissing passionately. At breakfast, Abigail asked, what will your parents think when you bring me to your house? They'll think I don't deserve you, but I'm really lucky. They'll tell me not to pass up the opportunity. My mom and grandmothers will want a quick wedding, and if you agree to me after I give you an engagement ring, I'll gladly accept, T parried, Rex. Even if I can't have kids? Even if you can't have kids, although, frankly, I wonder if that was Peter's problem and not yours. I hope you don't mind if I say goodbye to the sheep of God before we leave. Even though I don't like him, Peter is a decent guy, and I don't want to just pick up and leave. Plus, I really like most of the women and kids. Can we stop by there on the way to San Francisco? I think I'll probably do whatever you ask as long as I can keep making love to you, T smirked. Rex and then took and kissed her hand. T-Rex stayed in the background as Abigail bid them farewell. Unfortunately, Peter was mortified. The women and children shed a few tears, but most of the women were happy for her. Claudia, probably her best friend, hugged her and whispered in her ear, I always knew this day would come. Your outlook on life is different from the rest of us. I love you and wish you all the best. For the first five kilometers, Abigail shed tears as she sat in the cab of T-Rex's truck. Then she wiped away the last of her tears, turned to T-Rex and said, We need to get to the hotel early today. I want to show you the pleasure that awaits you for the rest of your life. Woe is me, T laughed. Rex, woe is me. Although it wasn't without a little drama, things went as well as could be expected in T's relationship. Rex and Abigail. The parents and grandparents were definitely smitten with Abigail's beauty, uprightness, and personality. The wedding took place a month after they arrived in San Francisco. Their first child was born almost exactly nine months after their first sex, probably conceived on the same day. It was clear that Abigail's inability to get Peter pregnant was not due to her infertility. As she seemed to produce children, if T. Rex, now known simply as Thomas, even looked at her with lust. By August 1942, they had two boys and a girl, and Abigail became pregnant again. The love and sexual bond between Thomas and Abigail was very strong. Even when Abigail was pregnant and restricting herself, they made love almost every single day. The fairy tale ended when Thomas was drafted into the army in 1942. His parents persuaded him to get a hardship exemption because he was soon to have four children under the age of six, but he refused. Abigail, who by then knew him better than anyone else in his life, never tried to talk him out of the service. She knew he could not remain passive when his country's way of life was threatened. By October 1942, he was demobilized. Given his background, he needed no training other than a refresher course and familiarization with some of the new weapons that had been developed. However, things did not end well for Thomas Rexroth's family, as Thomas was killed in the Battle of Okinawa in April 1945. To everyone's surprise, he was posthumously awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. In 1948, 
Abigail remarried the future governor of California and became the most revered and one of the most gorgeous first ladies in the state's history. She had no children by her second husband, but her two sons and two daughters by Thomas became Marine Generals, Physicians, California Attorneys General, and Pulitzer Prize-winning journalists. Abigail is also survived by her second husband. As Abigail lay on her deathbed, she had a picture of Thomas with his Congressional Medal of Honor on her chest, as well as one of the pictures Thomas took the day he massacred the three Jenkins brothers. It was an honor to marry him, were Abigail's last words to her madly loving children.